Good morning. Welcome to Rutgers Community Christian Church. We're so glad that you could join us this morning. My name is Bob Lin. We want to wish you Happy Valentine's Day, Happy Lunar New Year, and also it is the beginning of Lent. Let's prepare our hearts for worship by meditating on Psalm 62. Welcome back. As we prepare our hearts for call to worship, let me read for you um, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 22. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled to his body of, his, of flesh by his death, in order to present us holy and blameless and above reproach before God. to us a man in very nature God pierced for our iniquities as you hung upon the cross for God exalted you to the highest place and gave to you the right to bear the name above all names that at the name of Jesus we should bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord and when you come in glory for the world to see we will say To 
majesty Hail to the King of kings Lord Jesus our God Eagerly supreme authority in the true and living God at the name of Jesus we will bow as every tongue confesses you are Lord when you come in glory for the world to see we will see
Lift up our eyes, you're the giver of life. We lift up our eyes, lift up our eyes, you're the giver of life. We lift up our eyes, lift up our eyes, you're the giver of life. We lift up our eyes, lift up our eyes, you're the giver of life. You alone can rescue you. Can save you alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us, let us out of death. To you alone belongs the highest praise, and you alone can rescue, you alone can save, you alone can live. From the grave, you came down to find us, let us out of death. To you alone belongs the highest praise. To you alone belongs the highest praise. To you alone belongs the highest praise.
can seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Good morning. As we enter into a time of confession, I'm reminded from 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 9, the following verses. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us, forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What this is saying is that as we enter into a time of confession and forgiveness, that we are experiencing reality, the truth of who we are, as well as the truth of who God is. And so as you enter into a time of confession and you bring your sins before God, your brokenness, the things that you've left undone, also step into reality and experience the full cleansing from all unrighteousness that God provides for you. And so go now into a time of confession, and then I'll close this portion of our worship service with prayer. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways. We have followed too much of the devices and desires of our own hearts. But, O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who are remorseful according to your promises in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant that we from now on would live a godly, righteous, and sober life and resonate with the glory of your holy name. During the season of the Lunar New Year, some of us are revisiting feelings of newness, thoughts of restoration. But because of the season of the pandemic, we can feel the feelings of newness and joy don't linger like it should. This long season of fear has dulled our celebrations. Each of us cry out to you, O oh God, for renewing grace, Create in us a new heart and renew a right spirit within each of us. You call for our heart, Lord, and it is yours. It cost you so dearly, so enter and take possession of it. Father God, please remember those individuals and families in our church who are enduring through trials and storms of life, battling cancer, mourning the loss of loved ones, seeking employment, healing, from broken relationships, repairing their lives to function again. According to your promises in Christ, may you comfort and heal their minds, their bodies, and their souls. Grant a happiness and comfort that comes in possessing the righteousness of Christ, the compassion of our Lord, and the steadfast love of our living God. Gracious God, we want to lift up our nation, its leaders, the capital, and the president. Grant them moral direction for the Christians to be faithful ministers of your word and truth through the ways that they serve in, in government. May all those who govern and hold authority have wisdom and resolve so that, they, so that there may be justice and peace. Give them grace to do your will and commitment to carry out the duties of their office with integrity, service, and governance that fosters the thriving of all people. We thank you for hearing our prayers, and in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to follow along, and I invite you to please rise for the reading of God's word. Luke chapter five, verses 17 through 26. 
and it reads, On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there, who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise up and walk and go home. Pick up your, rise up, pick up your bed and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all and they glorified God and were filled with awe saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. This is the reading of God's word. Please be seated. We're going to talk about the authority of Jesus this morning, and we're going to show how Jesus' authority is to forgive is the most important thing, and that you are to go, go to him. You're to bring your friends to him. What's authority? Well, Authority explained is that authority is the power or right to give orders, to make decisions, and to enforce obedience. The professor has authority to assign homework, to give tests, to grade papers, to fail students. The doctor has the authority to order a prescription, to, de uh, to decide to have a surgical procedure, to declare someone is fit to drive again. A police officer has the authority to pull you over, to decide whether or not you are ha uh, you're careless driving. They also have the right to let you off with a warning so that you can go to church and be on time so that you can preach. In the first century, the people of Israel had the wonderful privilege to witness firsthand the authority of Jesus. They witnessed the feeding of thousands of people with only a few morsels of food, the restoration of sight to the blind, the resurrection of the dead, and many other miracles that our Lord performed. And people found Jesus' mighty works and His teaching particularly compelling. In fact, they were astonished, for He taught them as one who had authority and not as like one of the scribes, as we read in Mark chapter 1. And in our modern way of thinking, we like to compartmentalize. We like to break things into categories because it's easier to control things. It's easier to control our life and to tame the world around us. So let me give you an example. What does that look like? Let's say for a moment, let's pretend that you recently moved on campus at college. Let's just say mm, Rutgers. And you want to build relationships and you compartmentalize this process. And so what are you doing? You're creating categories. You're creating these friendships. There's these Christian communities. There's these study groups. Maybe you have a different set of workout buddies. Maybe you have some work connections. And then there's dating and romantic life. And you compartmentalize these groups and isolate them. You don't let them interact with each other. Why? Because you're still deciding if you want to pursue and deepen these relationships, you're still getting to know each other. So you don't want them to interact because things can get wild and chaotic and out of control. And so you are taming the world around you by compartmentalizing these relationships in your life. And so that also 
these individuals and all these people in your lives, they can only speak into parts of your lives that you choose. They can't speak into all parts of, of your life. And in the first century, people generally saw that uh, roles to be compartmentalized as well. That a teacher is a teacher, a doctor is a doctor, and a king is a king. And so what that means is that doctors don't teach, teachers don't rule, and kings don't heal. But here comes Jesus, and he is teaching, he is healing, he is declaring people forgiven. In the first century, people of Galilee witnessed the full scope of Jesus' authority. They experienced the reality of Jesus. And they found that you can't really compartmentalize him. He can't be tamed. He can't be controlled. He's exercising his authority over truth. He's exercising his authority over nature. He's exercising his authority with being right with God. And you can't just unsee and unhear Jesus after he does these miracles and these teachings and restores these people. People were blown away. They were left changed forever. And this scene here of what we see in John in Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26, is a snapshot of Jesus' authority. We're going to look at three things today. We're going to look at first, we're going to look at how four friends were so right about Jesus. Next, then we're going to look at how these legalists are so wonderfully wrong about Jesus. And then lastly, why Jesus' authority to forgive is the most important thing, period, full stop. So let's go. These four friends are so right about Jesus. They came seeking Jesus' ability and they found Jesus' authority. You see, to understand the Bible, you need to know how to read it. And there are a couple of ways that the Bible highlights something as important. And one of them is repetition. And we know that this account is so significant that the two other writers of the Gospels have also included this event in their recordings of the life of Jesus. So it's not just here in Luke chapter 5, but we also see it again in Matthew chapter 9 and Mark chapter 2. They give these parallel, parallel accounts of the same event. And this is how that event unfolds. Jesus has returned to the town of Capernaum after a wide ministry, wide ministry tour, proclaiming the truth and the power of the gospel. Now, instead of saying that Jesus was becoming famous, Luke just paints a picture of the room that Jesus is in to just show you how he has become famous. The religious elite, the Pharisees and the scribes of every village have come from all of, of the area, including from even Jerusalem, have come to listen to Jesus teach. So that means that from every village and town, the religious elite, the highest echelons of religious status and power have come here to Capernaum, to this, to this house, and cramming themselves in so that they can hear Jesus teach. And there were so many of them that these four men that are carrying a paralytic on, on the, his bed are coming in and they cannot come in through the normal entrance. It's too crowded. The crowds are there and preventing them from coming in. We don't know the names of the, of the four men that they don't seem like they have any titles. They weren't rich and powerful. If they were rich and powerful, they would be able to send their servants and send their servants to go take care of it. But they didn't. They did it themselves. They definitely weren't the religious or elite. Otherwise, they would be recognized by the other religious elite. In fact, the only thing that's identifiable about them is their faith. And Jesus sees their faith. It's the condition of of their faith. And it's the same thing with the paralytic. He has no name, he has no status, he has no power. There's nothing that identifies him. And we don't even know how his condition of paralysis comes about. We don't know if he was born like this or if an accident damaged his spinal cord. These are very much nobodies. But how do we know? 
How can we confirm that? Well, there's an external evidence and an internal evidence from them. On externally, no one cleared the way for them when they came. They didn't know, no one noticed them. They, they were invisible. They were disregarded. Their presence didn't stir people to instinctively help them or clear a way and let them through. It seemed like culturally they were just invisible people, disregarded. But also internally, what we notice is that these four individuals and the paralytic, they didn't get outraged. They didn't, they didn't scream and shout. They weren't even despairing. They were conditioned by life to expect that no one was going to help them. They were conditioned instead to be unconventional about how to get access. Often poverty forces you to work harder just to get access to the opportunities. And so they went on this roundabout, physically demanding and risky approach to get to Jesus. So the four men took up the stairs and they went up these stairs and up a ladder to the roof and they located where Jesus was and they identified where he was and they removed the tiles. Enough of the tiles that they can lower the bed with the paralytic down in front of Jesus and right before Jesus. They successfully placed their paralytic friend right before him and while their faith is plain and clear to Jesus, they believed that Jesus simply had the ability to heal. They came seeking after Jesus' ability, but what they found was Jesus' authority. Paralysis is understood accurately in the first century. The word literally means loose, to, to be loose, like, like water that can't take the shape and form of itself. It just takes the shape and form of whatever container it's in. It's loose. It kind of spills out. Paralysis meant that any force could manipulate a hand or an arm to wherever it wants it to go. And the only one who can't manipulate the body is the owner of the body himself. Curing someone of paralysis then in their mind, in their understanding, is a restoration of the motor function in order to live. And that's very important because this physical reality of the paralysis is to be a parable of the spiritual reality of what's going on in the people, not just these four individuals, but everyone in the room. And they were right that Jesus had the power and compassion to heal. They didn't realize how right they were though. See, Jesus didn't only just heal the physical, Jesus gave their friend ultimate forgiveness in order to restore their friend body and soul and spirit. So I want to explain to you what forgiveness means because if you understand what forgiveness means, then you understand what is going on and why, why there's an authority to forgiveness. You see, when Christians talk about forgiveness, it involves two things. One, it's declaring that what was done is wrong. That inherently in the definition of forgiveness is to not say it's okay or it's good or it's permissible or it's normal, but that it's wrong. That embedded in the forgiveness, when you forgive, you're not saying that it's okay. But at the same time, when you declare forgiveness, the act of forgiveness is that it's a resolve to no longer hold it against the offender and the willingness to absorb the cost. That, that it's a resolve to no longer hold it against the offender, but instead to absorb the cost. And so forgiveness in its essence is saying that what's done wrong is wrong. But, and it's not saying okay, but at the same time, forgiveness is the res refusal to keep charging that person for the wrong that they've done, to absorb the cost themselves. And Jesus fully restored their friend as if he had never sinned ever. And that is what's forgiveness. As if his friend had never bro had a broken relationship with his creator and whole in every way and never had to hide from God's sight. In a sense, they were asked, to, they were asking for, for, for help to fix a, a flat tire, and instead they got a new car and their mortgage got paid off. They were, they were asking for just a smile from God, 
and they left with, with keys to God's house. They're getting so much more. They were right about God's goodness, but they didn't know how right they were. And Jesus was restoring the most important things, not just legs to stand on, but a heart that beats confidently in the world, the heart that beats confidently before the living God. No longer apologizing for just existing. Freedom from guilt, recovering from that inner wholeness. Forgiveness is the end of spiritual hiding from God. It's about being seen by God, being known by God, and not being rejected by God. Instead, instead you're fully seen and fully known, warts and all, problems and all, scars and all, brokenness and dysfunctions and all, and still loved by God. That is forgiveness, to be seen and to be loved. And that was what Jesus was giving to their friend. They were so right. Jesus was going to restore their friend. He was going to restore everything to their friend. And Luke immediately brings our attention off of the paralytic now and onto the attention to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And these legalists are so wonderfully wrong about Jesus. They thought Jesus couldn't forgive sins until they saw their own sins being forgiven. Who are the legalists? Most in this room with Jesus are the religious elites. What does that mean? Well, the Pharisees, they were this non-priestly lay people who were a separatist group that wanted one goal, which was to keep the nation of Israel faithful to God. And they were willing to separate themselves from all groups and make these laws and ensure that no one would violate the laws. No one would break the laws of Moses. And so they made rules upon rules and these elaborate rules to kind of demand people on how they are to live their religious life. Their goal was to prevent the law from being violated. And even their name, Pharisees, is this, Pharise is this Aramaic term that means set apart. They were separatists. They love separating themselves from others. The teachers of the law or scribes, as you read in other gospels, they are there to help. And they, their expertise is to study legal questions and develop this code and this tradition of the Pharisees. They claimed authority as the gold standard of the religion of Israel. They believed that a person's significance rested purely in their law keeping of following the rules, of following the laws. And so they were legalists. They were all about following the rules and following the, about the laws. They are all about conforming and obedience to the laws and your significance is in how much you can obey these laws and avoid violating them. And so as soon as Jesus said, man, your sins are forgiven you, the, is, the legalists reacted. They said, who is this who speaks blas blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God? And to claim someone is forgiven by God is to speak on behalf of God, which is blasphemy. For, for, for us, misuse of God's name, speaking on behalf of God, cursing God, all count under this umbrella term of blasphemy. And it is so grievous to God that he commanded that those who blaspheme against him are punishable by death when he gave the law to Israel through Moses. The Pharisees and scribes weren't just questioning Jesus' claim of forgiveness. They weren't, of course, they were on the surface level questioning, is this person really forgiven? Can you forgive other people on behalf of God? They weren't just questioning Jesus' claim, but they were questioning who Jesus was, and they were contemplating putting Jesus to death. And that's very significant because their realization of what they were doing is going to affect how they respond. Jesus knows all the thoughts inside people's hearts. He knows all things. And he poses a question. What is easier to, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you or rise up and walk? 
ironically, it is easier to say your sins are forgiven you because one can't really prove or show whether someone's sins are forgiven. While at the same, while at the same time, still, it's much easier to prove and show if someone who's paralyzed can rise up and walk. So there's a sense of irony in it, but the reality is it's far more harder, far much harder for an individual to be forgiven than for them to be forgiven by God for them, than for them to be healed. Jesus is linking the healing and forgiving together by, do, by talking about this, that the healing that he does will, uh, will indicate the authority that he has to forgive. And in the process, raise natural questions about who Jesus is. He wants to cause them to think about his identity. So Jesus says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And he turns to the paralytic. He says, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. It's the moment of truth. What's going to happen? Is he going to be healed? Is Jesus going to be right? Either the man gets up and he walks or he continues to lie there. Either Jesus' claim comes through or he is utterly embarrassed. God does not help sinners. He doesn't listen to sinners. So what's going to happen? Jesus has put his entire reputation, even his own life at stake for this event. Will God vindicate him? Immediately, he rose up before them, picked up what he had been lying on, and went home, glorifying God. Jesus was right. Jesus was right. Jesus was right. He healed the man who was paralytic immediately. The man rose up. He was glorifying God all the way home. He was telling people of his story, of what Christ has done for him, the healing and also the forgiveness from God to be cleansed of all unrighteousness. He couldn't keep it to himself. He was sharing it to anyone who would listen. He's praising God to anyone who will hear it. God confirms Jesus' words. And that means Jesus was right about forgiveness. This, this means that Jesus was right about his identity. This means that Jesus was right about his claim to the authority, the authority to heal and the authority to forgive. Now look at what follows, follows in this text. It says, and amazement seized them all and they were, and they all glorified God and they were all filled with awe. They were filled with wonder. They were filled with excitement. It's like those moments where someone does a trick shot and they've tried over and over and over to, to get this trick shot. And they've, maybe their friends are recording it and they're recording it for hours and hours. And then finally, through this just random chance, they did the trick shot and it lands in. And they just go wild because it's, it's dude perfect. Everything went perfectly and, and the trick shot went in. Why are they so excited? Why are these religious elite, the Pharisees and the teachers of law, so excited? They said, we have seen extraordinary things today. These are the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the religious elite, the legalists. These people were experts on the law and they were sure that Jesus was blaspheming. They thought you couldn't be forgiven they thought Jesus was wrong. They were contemplating putting Jesus to death, remember, just a minute ago. And now they're filled with awe and they're praising God. They were proven wrong publicly, openly, undeniably. Now they have this person who's a living evidence that they were wrong. Their authority, their status, their, their, uh, their presence, their position in the in the in the in, in a religious sphere is being threatened. Why are they so amazed and in awe? Actually, this isn't a typical reaction of the Pharisees and the and the scribes. Typically, they're filled with outrage, they're filled with humiliation, they're filled with indignation. 
And in the end, as we get to at the end of every gospel, they're filled with murderous rage. But not here. Not now. Not with these people. The Pharisees and the scribes, not jealousy or anger, but amazement seized them all. And they glorified God. And they were filled with awe. They were gripped with amazement. And I think that Luke is not by accident using this language of suddenly being able to be controlled with their body. They were seized, uh, um, the opposite of being loose. They're now able to seize things and they were able to grasp the truth. They were able to grasp the reality of forgiveness. They were able to re grasp the reality of grace and that God has sought after them and come right before them. Let me tell you what I think is happening here. These are highly educated, intelligent, and deductive individuals. They have to be excellent at critical thinking because that's their line of work. And so they, did, they quickly realized that Jesus took a roundabout, indirect, risky approach in order to save them in order to impose into their lives and come before them so that they would be able to come before God. Jesus purposefully forgave the paralytic first instead of healing them so that he could show the saving grace to everyone in the room. These religious elite who thought that they were good. Just one minute ago, they were thinking of putting Jesus to death and now they realize that they were opposing God himself. They realized they deserved judgment and death. So why would they be amazed? Why would they be filled with awe? Because he had taken an alternate route. That he didn't give up when he just confronted them and they didn't respond. That, they, that he presented himself and was teaching with authority and they didn't bow down and worship him and he didn't give up. And he went on this alternate route, an indirect route, an unexpected route, and he came so that he would awaken, up, wake, awaken their eyes and their souls to see God. That God opened up his, the heavens and came down and broke through the ceilings of their theology and the ceilings of their understanding and broke through and healed this paralytic and at the same time broke through their callous hearts to realize that there is a God of grace and forgiveness. And their eyes were opened and because they're so good at critical thinking and at deduction, they realize that not only were their eyes opened, but they realize that the forgiveness is possible, that forgiveness has come, that forgiveness is shown before them, that forgiveness is being offered by Jesus. But then it becomes personal because they realize what they have done, that Jesus has read their hearts. And while they had no desire to love and worship God, that all their thinking was wrong, Jesus loved them anyway and showed grace to them by showing them He was the way to salvation, that He was the way to forgiveness. They were saying like, the healing is possible. He has, he's capable of healing. That means He's capable of forgiving. Wait a second, we were thinking about putting Him to death and He, he, he still showed it to us that we could be forgiven. As a matter of fact, no, no, no. Not only are we forgiven, He had to forgive us in order to show us salvation. He could have judged us. He could have kept that truth to Himself, but He showed it to us because He was already willing to forgive us. And we just had to take that forgiveness and believe in Him and believe in His authority. And they were just electrified with just the sheer grace and the willingness to go this indirect route in order to save them. And they're filled with awe of the sheer holiness and righteousness shown in the grace and patience of Jesus. They were thinking, we judged him a blasphemer, blasphemer and he refused to judge us. We considered him a fraud and he proved us wonderfully wrong. He showed us his authority and he spared us. We wanted to put him to death, and instead he gave us forgiveness and spiritual renewal. He awoke our spirits up so that we could see the real God and worship him. 
They were electrified with praise because they've been proven wonderfully wrong. They never knew how wonderful it was to be wrong. To this, Jesus absolutely had the authority to forgive and to heal. And not only that, he forgave and healed, not based on their merit or our merit, but he did it because out of the character of his heart and out of the love in his heart. He, they were saying to each other, he forgave and healed us before we even needed to know we needed to be saved. He forgave and healed us before we even knew we needed to be saved. And when they knew that, they knew that they were wrong. Jesus knew that we were wrong and he saved us anyway. And they not just saw it, they didn't just know it on a cognitive level, they experienced it, they felt it, they heard the patience and the love and the confidence and the willingness to invite them in to redemption. There was always was a question in the Pharisees and the scribes' minds and in their hearts that they just didn't want to look at. They just wanted to be in denial about. And that question was, can I be so forgiven that I am regarded as if I have never have sinned at all? And Jesus just said and showed them, yes. Four friends, nobodies, outsiders, they saw an opportunity and they had faith in Jesus and they put their friend in God's hands as an expression of their faith. Jesus transformed the paralytic physically and spiritually. They were all insiders of God's redemption, even though in society and culture, even in the religious spheres, they were outsiders. This paralytic unknowingly brought the Pharisees and the scribes to Jesus, and Jesus transformed these religious elite too. And he made them insiders of God's redemption. God is using these legalists now, and he is who are outsiders sp once spiritually to God and didn't even know it, and he's brought them in. He's brought these legalists who are thinking about putting God to death because of their misunderstanding of who God was. And they were opposed to Jesus, and Jesus transforms them and shows them grace and invites them into redemption, invites them in to spiritual renewal and spiritual life instead of pursuing this drivenness of finding your significance in living out rules and laws. God is using now these religious elite to show you, to bring you to Jesus now. If God can take these sworn enemies, these people who were murderous, and now through grace, through this magnificent grace, are, have seen the salvation, that God's saying that grace is still available to you too. If you want to stop hiding, to stop apologizing for existing, to be seen fully, and yet also to be loved fully, find forgiveness in Jesus. It will transform you. It will bring you inside God's redemption. Jesus' authority to forgive is the most important thing, period, full stop. Jesus asked what is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or to rise up and walk. And he knows exactly how costly and hard it is to say your sins are forgiven. Remember what I said, that forgiveness has two parts. The first part is saying that what was done was certainly wrong, but at the same time, it will not be held against you and instead will be absorbed by the person that was, that was offended, absorbing the cost. And Jesus had no friends to stay by his side. They couldn't stay awake to pray. They fled when Jesus was arrested. No one opened an alternate route for him. In fact, in all accounts of him on the cross, instead of an opening to the, to the roof, darkness enclosed around him. Jesus practiced ultimate cosmic forgiveness on the cross, declaring forgiveness, declaring that the wickedness of the sin has, is wicked, but at the same time, absorbing that cost of sin personally by willingly substituting himself for our sake because of the penalty of, the, of our sin. He was willing to take our place and bear the full brunt of God's wrath 
for us. And yet they're surrounded by enemies that were taunting and mocking him. Jesus seeing them celebrating their violence and knowing exactly what is in their hearts. And yet Christ would not let evil triumph in him. He hung on the cross and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he knew exactly how hard it is to say your sins are forgiven because he totally absorbed that cost. Love triumphed. The forgiveness of God has come to us in Christ. And on the third day, Jesus rose up and walked. And that means that the cost has been fully paid because if he didn't finish paying that, co that cost for us, he would stay dead. But he rose again and showing in his scars that he's paid the cost and that cost can never come after you ever again. Jesus is offering salvation to you. Jesus is taking your sin away and he's giving you his righteousness right now. And that righteousness, that belonging, that honor, that love from God the Father now is all shared with you by no merit of your own, but by the grace of Christ himself. It began with his forgiveness and it ends with his righteousness and his righteousness restores us fully. And this is why Jesus's authority to forgive is the most important thing. We are all in this story somewhere. Maybe you're an insider, a nobody in this world, but a somebody intimately familiar with the forgiveness of God. You're bringing friends to Jesus. Good. Don't stop. Maybe you were a paralytic and you were transformed by Jesus. Someone had the faith and determination to bring you to Jesus and wouldn't stop bringing you to Jesus until you believed and you were transformed and you were set free. Jesus spoke to you, your sins are forgiven, rise up and walk. And you did. Remember and celebrate God's grace in your life. Share your story. Pray that Jesus would do the same in the lives around you for what he did for you and use you to be a blessing to these people. But maybe you are haunted. You're haunted by the fact that you're not living up to your own standards, that you're not living up to other people's standards. And you wonder if it's really possible for someone like me to to be forgiven so thoroughly. If the enemies of Jesus can find grace, then you can too. Ask God for help to recognize the real Jesus and find the forgiveness that's being offered to you right now. Step out and be seen. Reach out to our church. We have people that are eager to talk to you. Send me an email. Talk to a trusted Christian friend. Jesus' authority to forgive is the most important thing. Go to him. Bring your friends. Let's pray. Oh Lord, because you sought us while we were broken, weak, and invisible, and you restored us with your very own life and made us new again, whole again, we cannot be happy without the righteousness of Christ. Aid us now to make us friends of the broken, friends of the weak, friends of the invisible. Help us to know how we can help others come out of darkness and into the light like you have brought us into the light. We pray you would make us agents of reconciliation to the world in all ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, as we sing the song of response, let's proclaim together, I will trust my Savior Jesus. Trust my Savior Jesus when my darkest doubts befall. Trust Him when to simply trust Him seems the hardest thing of all. I can 
can trust my Savior Jesus. Trust Him when my strength is small. For I know the shield of Jesus is the safest place of all. Jesus, only Jesus, help me trust you more and more. Jesus, only Jesus, may my heart be ever yours. I will trust my Savior Jesus. He has said his way is best, for I know the path he's chosen leads to everlasting rest. Jesus, only Jesus, help me trust you more and more. Only Jesus, may my heart be ever Lord Jesus, we believe in your power and authority to heal us and heal the world. Indeed, please help us to trust you more and more, and may our heart be ever yours. It's in your name that we pray this. Amen. Thank you, Pastor James, for the message. 
that helps us to understand once again the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. At this time, I want to share with you some announcements. First, the uh, Lent prayer meetings will begin on February 17th. Uh, they will revolve around certain scripture readings. These readings will appear on Wednesday at the prayer meeting and then on Sunday during the service. So please join us if you can on Wednesday so that you get a chance to meditate on these verses and prepare for the Lenten themes that is um, that we'll be going through. Another announcement is that um, please pick up your or download your annual giving statements. They are available on Touchpoint. All you have to do is go to ec.rccc.org slash backslash touchpoint. So please uh, go download. They're available, your uh, annual giving statements. And then we would like to invite you to join us for the Connection Cafe and enjoy some time of getting to know other people. Thank you so much. We're going to ask uh, Pastor James now to give us the benediction. Please join me with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you that we can find that our King is also our teacher, our doctor, and our friend. And so begin this healing process in our lives. We ask that you would help us to do what the crowd did that day and be seized by amazement and be glorifying God filled with awe. May you show us extraordinary things and see your son as king of our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to please rise and lift up your hands to receive this good word. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you for joining us for worship. We hope that you'll join us in the Connection Cafe and also in our Sunday School programs. We hope you have a blessed week. And I'll see you next week. Take care. God bless. Trust my Savior Jesus when my darkest doubts befall. Trust Him when to simply trust Him seems the hardest thing of all. Trust my Savior Jesus, trust Him when my strength is small. For I know the shield of Jesus is the safest place of all. Jesus, only Jesus, Help me trust you more and more. Jesus, only Jesus, may my heart be ever yours. I will trust my Savior Jesus. He has said his way is best. For I know the path He's chosen leads to everlasting rest. Jesus, only Jesus, help me trust You more and more. Jesus, only Jesus, may my heart